to uh, begin by sharing a story. There was a man that uh, a man that was in need of a job. He had lost his job. He had been high up as an executive. And he finally decided that he would just go to what was local and find out if he could get a job there. So he went to the zoo and he asked the head of employment at the zoo. He said, you have a job for me. I've worked in the corporate realm, but I can't find any place to work. I'm at a desperate place. And if you could give me a job, I'd appreciate it. The head of hiring at the zoo said, we don't have anything. I wish we did, but we don't. And so I'm just going to have to say, I, I, I'll have to turn you away. The man said, I tell you, I'm desperate. I will take anything. And so at that moment, the head of hiring felt sorry for him. He said, well, thinking about it, there's been the favorite exhibit of the people here at the zoo. It's the gorilla exhibit and our gorilla died. We don't have the new gorilla yet. If you wouldn't mind putting on a gorilla outfit and going into the gorilla exhibit until we can get the gorilla, that would be a job for you and I could pay you. It wouldn't pay much, but I could pay you. The man said, I'll do it. I need a job. So the first day he is in the exhibit, he's got his gorilla outfit on and he's kind of standing there. He doesn't know quite how to be a gorilla, but he notices that the families are pointing out the gorilla you know, to, the, to the children and everything. The parents are. And so at that moment, he begins to walk side to side. And as he does, oh, the people are enjoying it and they're clapping. So he's getting into it now. And now he's not only walking, he's moving like a gorilla. And soon he's running from one side to the other, back and forth. And he runs so fast that he goes up the side of the gorilla exhibit on the wall and finds himself falling over into the next exhibit. And it's the lion. And he can see the most ferocious lion looking at him that he's ever seen. And it now has focused in on him to a point where it's walking towards him. He's backing up, the man in the gorilla suit. And as he's backing up, he realizes that lion is beginning to pick up its pace. And now it's running at him. He can't take it anymore. And he screams out, help! At that moment, the lion says, shut up, stupid. You're going to make us both lose our jobs. (laughs) That has nothing to do with my sermon, but I just thought I'd share that with you. Today, I actually want to talk about grace. It's interesting, the story that I'll be sharing from today in the scriptures uh, is consider, was considered by Ralph Waldorf uh, uh, Emerson to be the greatest story ever told. We're going to be looking at it in just a, m- a moment, but what a, what a statement, the greatest story ever told. Matthew 13, 35, the Bible says, so was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. Remember, we talked about story a few weeks ago and how it is that things are remembered better in story, more likely to be forgotten if not placed in the context of story. Jesus would tell stories. He would tell what were called parables. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. Do you know Jesus told 46 parables during his ministry. They're short stories, and they teach us moral and spiritual lessons. In fact, they're a glimpse into the eternal. They give us a glimpse of the kingdom of God, glimpses into something we may not have fully experienced this side of heaven. And they are also analogies of something that Uh, that would be considered something that would be everyday life to the hearer, and yet it's telling you about a spiritual truth. It's meant to draw people into a new way of thinking and a new way of acting. That is what a parable is. And Jesus would reveal and give a better understanding of the kingdom of God. So Luke 15, here's the story that Ralph Waldorf Emerson spoke of. Luke 15, starting with the 11th verse. In this whole chapter, by the way, is written in red. And you know what that means, the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. And after he had spent everything there was, a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out 
to a citizen of that country who sent him to uh, his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am not, no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. And meanwhile, the older son was in the field And when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked him what was going on. Your young, your your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving For you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, "You uh, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead. And is alive again. He was lost and is found. Now, this is a family that is experiencing uh, dysfunction. Uh, Jesus' family, if you look at it, it's it's interesting. Again, I stated to you when we were talking about uh, family, our stories and how our stories begin with our family of origin and so many things that define us are from our family of origin. And we were talking about that. Well, Jesus has a lineage. And when you read through the lineage, uh, you recognize that there are some individuals in that lineage, a prostitute, an adulteress, others that we would say, well, what is that person doing in Jesus' family line? This makes no sense. Until we realize that even though we did not select the family of our origin, meaning we were born into a family, we had no choice, but that's our assignment by God, we do know that Jesus was able to select his family of of origin. Jesus was able to select the ones in his family line. And that's why it's beautiful to see all of the dysfunction that is there because we see that Jesus is the healer. Jesus is the one that makes one whole again. Jesus is the one who saves to the uttermost parts of the earth. The author Philip Yancey looked at six individuals who greatly influenced the 20th century. And he figured that the ones that he thought were the greatest influencers, at least this is, these are the ones he put in the list. You may have put, may put others. But Philip Yancey said there were six individuals he chose that he felt greatly influenced the 20th century. Billy Graham, Pope John Paul II, Mother Teresa, Nelson Mandela, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, and... Uh, Ellie Wiesel. Now, again, we don't necessarily see in that list Churchill or Einstein. These must have been his favorites in history. But of those, as he studied them, only one, Billy Graham, had a normal, pain-free childhood. Every single one of the others had very great difficulties to ever rise up to do what they did in life and to be known by us today If we only knew the pain that people have been through, people's stories uh, that they share, if we only could get into the depth of what is the pain that they've been through, uh, we would be less likely to judge. 
And uh, I remember Helen Keller once said that the world is filled with suffering, but it's also filled with individuals who have overcome the suffering. Vance Havner, who was one of my dad's favorite preachers, said these words. God uses broken things. It takes broken soil to produce a crop, broken clouds to give rain, broken grain to give bread, broken bread to give strength. It is the broken alabaster box that gives forth perfume. And of course, that wonderful story of the anointing of Jesus' feet right before he'll go to the cross and it's broken open and that expensive perfume that's placed on Jesus' feet as others rebuked her for doing so because it was of great expense and could have been given to the poor. But she was anointing him for the day of his burial. Their version, the younger son uh, uh, in the version of the Jewish rabbi stories, and I, I haven't mentioned it to you le- yet, let me mention it. Scholars have actually discovered that there is a similar story to the story of what we call the prodigal son story. And it existed amongst Jewish rabbis for many years before Jesus told the story of the prodigal son. And in the rabbi version of the story, uh, the son runs away from home. He spends all of the father's money and he came crawling back home and the father rejects him. So when Jesus began to tell this story, his audience would have thought, we've heard this before. We know the ending. The son gets rejected. And that's Old Testament legalism. But Jesus changed the story. He brought in grace. Now, grace is defined this way, the unmerited favor of God. And I think that when we think of grace, we think of that unmerited favor at the point of salvation. And thank God we can come to Jesus and we can know Jesus and he forgives us of our sins and we can walk in wholeness and freedom. He and she whom the son sets free is free indeed. And that's wonderful. And we think of grace in regard to salvation. Let's not shortchange grace. And that's hard to say because my goodness, salvation is the greatest miracle of all. But if we really understand grace, we'll understand grace is so much more than the unmerited favor of God at the point of salvation. And so I want to talk about that a little bit with you today uh, because grace actually shows the limitless power of God in our lives. Uh, It isn't limited by our weakness. And the religious say, get it right for God to love you. And Jesus says... Come to me imperfect. That's exactly the way I receive you. And he brings forgiveness and he brings healing. Let's go to Romans in the book of Romans in the third chapter, uh, starting with the 20th verse. And the Bible says, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which uh, the law and prophets testify. This uh, This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that that came by Christ Jesus. So the law exposes us as to our shortcomings, but Jesus paid the price to redeem us. This is the power of grace. And grace doesn't, uh, doesn't cover up or overlook sin. That's not what the Bible is saying. Grace is God's love when we least deserve it. Can I hear an amen to that? And every one of us who have experienced God's grace knows that that grace came when we least deserved it. In 2 Corinthians, in the 12th chapter, starting in the 8th verse, the Bible says, three times I pleaded. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. He has a thorn in the flesh, and he's pleading for it to be taken away. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. This mysterious thorn in the flesh that was uh, so frustrating to him that he was dealing with. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is 
is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That's the testimony of the Apostle Paul right as he's going through one of the most difficult things in his life. And that is that this thorn in the flesh, now I can go into it. There's a lot of things people think the thorn in the flesh might have been. And uh, I think that scholars tend to focus mostly into it being something with his eyes. And the reason why is there's a moment in which uh, Paul uh, is, is dictating a letter and it says something about his, that he was thankful for the largeness of the print of what had come to him that he read because otherwise he may not have been able to read it. So there's the idea that there's something there that had to deal with the eyes. And back in Bible days, in Paul's day, there was an affliction of the eye that I almost don't want to describe, but you are the first service, so you're not going directly to lunch. Maybe you after this, maybe you are. But let's just say it was very difficult to look at as to what came out of the eyes. And how difficult would that have been if Paul was preaching the gospel, and as he's preaching the gospel, here he is oozing from the eyes. For people not to want to see that, not to want to look upon that. And God, wouldn't you just take this away? Why would you allow for me to be be having this difficulty, whatever the thorn in the flesh was, in the midst of preaching the gospel? I would think this would be taken away. And yet he found that in his weakness, when he felt most broken, when he felt by his own strength he couldn't do it, in his weakness, God showed himself to be powerful and strong. And that's your testimony as well. I'll tell you what, it's when I feel like I most blew it in regard to to sharing a message that so often I'll see the greatest response and people making decisions for God because it's not in my power. It's in the power of Almighty God. And you can know that in everything that you do in life. It is not by your strength. And that's our testimony Because we can speak of the greatness of God, the power of God in the midst of our weakness. Can I hear an amen to that? So grace does not cover up or overlook sin. We know that grace is powerful. Let's continue to look at this. In fact, in 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, or rather the 12th chapter, I'm going to read that 10th verse. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. And I don't know anybody who listens to that who doesn't think, what? How in the world are you delighting in insults? Somebody insult me? I can show you just how sharp my tongue can be coming right back at you. I can think quick on my feet. I can give it to you as strong as I get it, maybe even stronger. Listen, that's what it not, it's not what it's about. It's about the fact that in the midst of our most difficult times, when we feel like the air is knocked out of us, we ought to be rejoicing because our God is all over us. He's got his arms around us. He shows us his grace by walking us through a a whole contingent of our enemy. And in the midst of it all, he can cause us to be at peace with our enemy because God has his hand upon us and walks us right through in the midst of the things that we're going through. And what a great thing to know that grace is there in the midst of our most difficult moments. So... Let's talk about grace as being power then. Grace is associated with the gifts of the Spirit. In 1 Peter 5.10, the Bible says that grace uh, restores, that grace makes firm, that grace is steadfast, makes us steadfast. In the book of Hebrews, the 12th chapter in the 15th verse, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. And when grace is absent, bitterness prevails. Acts 20, 32, now I commit myself to you, God, and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Grace builds you up. So when we're thinking about grace as the moment of salvation, let me tell you right now, if you're going through something, grace builds you up. Grace gives you hope. 
Grace, yes, gives eternal life, but grace also does much more. Do you know that in the Bible, all these things are found? You ready for what grace does? Not only does grace bring you into a relationship with Jesus, but with grace is power. The power of the Holy Spirit is in your life by grace, the Bible says. Grace brings you restoration, restores to you what the enemy thought he could have taken away from you. Wow, I'm telling you right now, I pray restoration into your life. I pray that you're restored many times over what the enemy thought he could take from you. Grace also makes steadfast. There's the ability to stand in the midst of the storm, to be strong when everybody says, how can that person be strong in the midst of all the attacks? Well, grace makes one steadfast. Grace heals bitterness, according to the scriptures. Grace builds you up. Grace gives you hope. Grace assures your future. And by the way, we don't often think about it, but can I tell you that when you're in Christ Jesus, you have a hope of the future? The Bible says that the same resurrection power that was in Jesus to raise him from the dead is in you and is in me when we're in Christ Jesus. That's a powerful concept right there. And yet at the same time, there are moments when I can get sick. And there are moments in which I can feel a weakness physically, even as I feel strength at times physically. So what's going on if I have this resurrection power in my body, if I, if I am in Christ and therefore the resurrection power is in me, what is going on? And I believe that we're in uh, an almost but not yet period of time. And I believe that when Jesus comes, we'll know what it is then to, be, uh, to rise up with him. And we'll know what it is to be in our new bodies. There'll be no more sorrow, no more tears, and all of that will be there. But we're still in a point at which we have a promise and we have, uh, uh, we have Jesus. And yet we also, the enemy is still trying to attack. There will be a time in which, do you know, the enemy is going to be uh, vanquished, the Bible says, to the pit. And will no longer be able to torment us. And what a wonderful thing that is. But we can have victory in the midst of it all. Even as we walk this earth by grace, we can be steadfast. The word prodigal, when we talk about the prodigal son, actually means wasteful. That's what that word means, recklessly wasteful, a squanderer. In Luke 15, 12, the Bible says uh, that the prodigal son, in the story of the parable, says, Father, give me my share of the estate. In Proverbs 13, 22, in the first part of that verse, the Bible says a good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children. And in Proverbs 20, 21, the Bible says an inheritance claimed too soon will not be blessed at the end. So in Luke 15, verse 12, as the son is saying, give me my share of the inheritance, it is the equivalent of saying, Father, Drop dead. The estate is to be dispersed only upon death. The Jewish law says if two sons, if there are two sons, the older receives two thirds and the younger one third. It isn't fair. That isn't right. How many of you are the babies of your family? Yeah, Yeah, we we want our share. (laughs) Those words give me. They're selfish, they're impatient. They're demanding, they, they uh, have a sense of entitlement in them. They speak to this prodigal son's own plans and own, way, own ways, not the father's. In verse 12, in the second part of that verse, the Bible says, so he uh, divided his property between them. That word in the Greek, that word property, actually means life. Everything he had built up through life, everything, everything he was, was being divided at that moment. In verse 13, the younger son, the Bible says, set off for a distant country far from home where his identity was no longer known. And we've all taken paths, if you think about it, and that's why we've been talking about the highs and the lows of our defining moments in life so that we can have our unique story come forth, we can see it in our highs, 
We can see it in the lows that have defined us, and we extract that God narrative to say, God, what were you saying? So easy to be found when we're on the mountaintop, so difficult when we're in the valley. But we know that he is, is of a different identity, it would seem now that he's in this far off country. And the Bible says, ponder the path of your feet. And the reason why is we need to consider where are we? Where are we going? What's the path that God is leading us on? Not the path that we're simply taking. In verse 15, the Bible says that he fed the pigs. Here's the job he has. It's kind of like the guy in the, in the gorilla outfit. He fed the pigs. And the Jews were to avoid pigs, pork. It's the opposite of his identity. And it's beneath him. And then in verse 17, we see the Bible says, when he came to his senses. What a statement. When he came to his senses. And there's a power of pausing for a moment to assess where you're at. Now we can assess where we are at financially. We can assess where where we're at in our careers. We can assess where we're at in our relationships. There's so many ways we can assess where we're at. But where are we at with God? Where are we at with the Father? And then we see that in verse 18 through 19... In Luke 15, so let me get a hold of that, 18 through 19 here. The Bible says, and you're probably reading it before I can get to it. Stop doing that. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And we see those scriptures there. And we're struck by the honesty that is now in his life, by the way he speaks, he doesn't parse words. We see that he doesn't blame anybody else. There are no excuses. And it's amazing because human nature always wants to minimize what are our weaknesses, minimize where we have gone wrong and done something wrong. We want to, in some way, find a way to cover it up, to avoid the embarrassment. That's not what he's doing here. He is extremely honest as to where he's at as he's come to his senses. And he's not saying everybody has done this, giving those excuses. He doesn't try to redefine sin. Instead, what he does is he speaks forth what is true. And Henry Nouwen gave a a quote, and I think it's a very, very powerful uh, statement. And Nouwen is one that we study in seminary and uh, and a powerful writer, a powerful a counselor, he said, although claiming my true identity as a child of God, I still live as though the God to whom I am returning demands an explanation. He's talking about the prodigal son here. I still think about his love as unconditional, about home as a place I am not yet fully sure of. While walking home, I keep entertaining doubts about whether I will be truly welcome when I get there. As I look at my spiritual journey, my long and fatiguing trip home, I see how full it is of guilt about the past and worries about the future. I realize my failures and know that I have lost the dignity of my sonship, but I am not yet able to fully believe that that where my failings are great, grace is always greater. Still clinging to my sense of worthlessness, I project for myself a place far below that which belongs to the son. Verse 20, while he was still a long way off, the Bible says, and I think it's such a poignant statement. Listen to this. While he was still a long way off and is spoken not from the father's vantage point, but from the son's. He felt the father was distant from him while still a long way off. And our actions will follow our perceptions. The father was watching before the son was even returning. He was standing in a certain direction. He was looking in a certain direction. He was ready for something that hadn't even happened yet. The father was watching for the return of his son. People give up. People let go. But I'll tell you what, 
A loving father never does. And in verse 20, the father, the Bible says, was filled with compassion. This wasn't perhaps what the son was thinking while he was still a far way off with all the concerns that would be on his thoughts and thinking he might not be accepted. He might be judged immediately. But the father was filled with compassion. That's so unexpected. That's so contrary to the world. Think of who who God has forgiven. Abraham lied. Noah was a drunk. David was an adulterer. We see Paul was persecuted. And he was persecuted because he was seen as one that persecuted the church. And he was forgiven by the early church. Forgiveness is the releasing of condemnation. Forgiveness sees uh, no wrong anymore. We think of the love chapter, holds no record of wrongs, chooses healing and reconciliation. God is not condemning. He loves you beyond reason. And in verse 20 in the second part of that, the father ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. Now, immediately we need to remember in the context of a parable, this is a glimpse into the heart of almighty God, the hev- your heavenly father. And so we're seeing that almighty God loves unconditionally. Almighty God is looking for you to just look at him. Almighty God is wanting to let you know you are forgiven and you are loved as you turn to him. And we see in the scriptures, he ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. What a great statement there. And Henry Nowen once more, a quote. He says, I am beginning now to see how radically the character of my spiritual journey will change when I no longer think of God as hiding out. And making it as difficult as possible for me to find him. But instead, as the one who is looking for me while I am doing the hiding. <laughs> what a statement. In Bible days, the Jewish son, uh, we see if the Jewish son lost inheritance uh, and lost it amongst the, the Gentiles, a ceremony would then be held. And it was called Kez, Keza. Uh, I'm not going to say this right. Kazaza, and even if I didn't say it right, it ought to be called that because that's a fun sounding word. Kazaza, um, where the community would gather together in front of this prodigal that has squandered amongst the Gentiles the inheritance. And they would have a large pot in front of the prodigal and they would say uh, in front of him, you are now cut off from your people. Uh, it would be considered undignified for a nobleman to run. But watch the father as he runs towards the prodigal son to take the shame on his behalf should anyone else be trying to condemn him. In verse 21 through 22, uh, the father interrupts and uh, we see, and again, in this, let me go back to it. In the 20. First verse, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And when we see this, we see it's modeling forgiveness. A robe is dignity and honor. That's what a robe is. A ring is a sign of authority. In verse 28, the Bible says the other brother became angry and, con- and refused to come in. There are two sons that we see in this story, as I mentioned before. One is bent on living uh, for himself, and one is unwelcoming and self-righteous. In verse 32, it says of the son who went away, he was lost and is found. And it's so important that we capture God's love toward us, that we recognize that God will take us even when we're most lost. And will gather us right to himself. God is watching for you. God it will run towards you. God doesn't care what anybody else thinks. He loves you. And no matter what you've been through, you can be confident of that. Rise to your feet, if you will. I want to pray for you. God covers our shame. He replaces our shame with dignity and belonging. He re- reestablishes our authority. 
I want you to get a fresh revelation of who God is today and what grace is all about. And I believe that God is offering his grace to you. You may be here today and you don't know where you stand with God. You're not exactly certain. And I want you to be certain before you leave this place that you have a relationship with God that nobody can talk you out of. You know who you are in Christ because you've received Jesus as your Savior and Lord. I'm not talking about church attendance. I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about doing good things. I'm talking about a relationship with Jesus. Of all the great great world religions that we can discuss, so much is about, in the concept of what these religions are about, is, is doing works to get God to love you. And the beauty of Christianity is it isn't about all about works, it's about relationship. It's about the fact that what needed to be done was done on the cross and you need to receive that. Then I want you to think of grace today as the grace of God that is power in your life. The power to break everything that you feel binds you. The power to break anything that is a habit, anything that you feel ashamed of, to break that sense of guilt and to break that sense of shame so that you can be free. So let's pray together right now. And I can tell you that you can be steadfast and strong great man of God, a great woman of God. And Heavenly Father, as we bow our heads now, we pray to you. And I'd ask that everyone pray. And heaven is listening. Pray out loud this prayer with me that will be a prayer for you to receive Jesus or to rededicate your heart. Dear Jesus, I repent of my sin. You are holy. You died on the cross for me. You rose from the dead. I believe in my heart. I confess with my mouth that you are my Savior. You are my Lord. I give you my life. Some of you will pray this. I rededicate my heart. God, I just pray that you'll place your hand upon each and every one that is here. That God, you will minister grace now. It's no longer about you being condemned even by your own thoughts. Or anybody else, it's about being set free. Now I'll tell you, it's about victory.